this? Yeah. Hey. So my presentation is Ace and Arrow Zines as Community History and Community Building. There's going to be heavy emphasis on the history for this presentation because I have some stuff I'm really excited to share. So, <laughs> yeah, so who am I and why am I qualified to talk about this subject? Uh, oh, oops. <laughs> I am 27, and I have identified as asexual since around 2010. Um, I'm not exactly sure the exact year, because it was sort of gradual. Uh, my specific identity is gray, romantic, bi slash pan romantic, gray, asexual, and I identify as queer. I participated in ACE community in some way since 2011, first under a pseudonym, <laughs> to be expected. And in 2014, I got really, really into zines because I was introduced to asexual zines specifically. Now I'll get into what zines are and uh, why they're important after this slide. In 2015, I co-founded uh, the ACE Zine Archive, which is currently the most comprehensive resource documenting how asexuality is uh, represented in zines. And I put hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours of my free time into researching and collecting zines online. And I'm not even an academic. <laughs> this is a passion project. So I am responsible for finding the bulk of the zines that are listed on the ACA website. And uh, I've been told that I'm like scarily good at finding zines to list. I had a story I was going to tell you, but I don't think it's time to tell. <laughs> and I own over 2,000 physical zines. I've made over 25 zines, including many with ACE and eight-year-old content. And I'm very active in the current zine community, teach workshops about zines, and even organize Connecticut's only zine host. So, what's a zine? Zines are, they're essentially like do-it-yourself, handmade, self-published booklets, usually with a print run of under a thousand, usually. That's not always a stable definition. Um, I was going to rattle off a little bit of zine history, but I don't think there's time for this. <laughs> But I have resources that explain more about the history of zines uh, on my website, which we'll keep up to later. So, what makes something a zine and not something else? So, here are some common characteristics of zines that make them stand out from other self-published media. So, they're usually cheaply produced on a copier or a uh, cheap printer. Uh, very DIY, often cut and pasted together, or at least the master copy. And made of paper, usually. Usually. <laughs> I've seen lots of zines printed in all sorts of unusual materials. And usually a booklet format, but occasionally a pamphlet or a newspaper format. Although those get into a gray area of whether it's a real zine. Often traded by mail. Uh, print run usually below a thousand, but usually much lower than that. Written, edited, and produced by the same person or a small group. It is a hobby with little expectation of making money. Some people, this is like the most important thing. If you try to make money off of zines, they'll say that's not a real zine. Or if you put an ISBN on it. <laughs> and they have their own sort of associated underground community of people who make zines, trade them. And, uh, I mean, well, some, some zines are bought and sold, but usually for a, a low amount of money. You're not really making money from this. You put a lot more work into it and then you get money out of it. And they can be li uh, literally about anything that can be put into print. And they've traditionally allowed marginalized groups to distribute their work uncensored. And they tend to be politically and socially radical under a common activist tool. <laughs> so, what do people write about in zines? I'll go through this pretty quickly. Per zines are personal zines. Comp zines are a compilation zine, though, usually from multiple people writing on a specific topic. Pan zines, that's sort of self-explanatory. Mini comics are a comic zine, even if it's not physically mini. It's just sort of stuck that way. And art zines, fiction zines, poetry zines are chapbooks, although that's also sort of a gray area in some cases. <laughs> photo zines, and there's also subgenres of photo zines. Uh, political zines, DIY zines, and feminist zines are all very common. And that's not even covering every single genre. There's literally zines about anything. So why are zines important? I'm going to be breaking this up into four reasons uh, to keep this structured. 
Number one, zines are philosophies, and I'll explain what this means. <laughs> Number two, zines are a great educational tool. Number three, zines build community. And number four, zines promote personal growth. So in a general sense, this is what zines or fossils mean. Zines are able to preserve colloquial speech uh, of a, a specific community, like almost like it's been preserved in amber. And uh, they're much more raw and less censored uh, than mainstream media. Like, you, you don't have to go through editors. And if you look at zines produced over time, you can sort of trace linguistic evolution, which is really important for being essential in the communities. And zines document marginalized histories that would otherwise remain buried, which is part of why it's so important to keep hold of zines before they fly away. Because <laughs> they, uh, as, as with anything with under a print run of a thousand, they can easily get lost to time. So. You have probably seen this zine somewhere. If you know, if you have seen any zines on asexuality at all, it's probably this one. I saw people prepping, I saw copies of it here today that someone else was responsible for. <laughs> so zines are a great educational tool. So zines, uh, like especially those that the author loves to be reproduced, like this one, can spread like wildfire online and in real life. And zines are cheap to produce uh, and pretty easy and have a low barrier to entry. You pretty much just have to have access to a copier and some paper and drawing materials. And zines are really good for avoiding censorship and the desire of publishers to market to the majority's interests. So you talk about really niche topics. And if done properly, zines can use their sense of experiential authority, like someone's like talking from their own experience, and lack of a, like a slick corporate appearance to appeal to young people. And zines tend to not speak down to you. They are all about being on the same level as another person, as equals. So zines also build community. This here is a picture uh, from the New York City Feminist Zine Fest where I tabled earlier this year. And um, so like, there's more to the picture. It's like a whole big room and it's like full of people for hours and like, it's great. <laughs> And there's like over 50 people who make zines coming from all over, including other countries, to come to be at this zine fest. And uh, people come and buy their zines, and there's workshops, and it's great. <laughs> so zines bring people together across distances, including in person. And zines also are very helpful to make friends and pen pounds, which is still a thing that exists. <laughs> I've gotten mail from people who make zines in like literally all sorts of different countries, all over the United States. That's how I ended up with over 2,000 zines. <laughs> and the zine community is, tends to be a relatively safe environment to publish your things, because the community is really supportive, and it's not like the internet where you're gonna get lots of trolls. And yeah, so more, more control over distribution than blogs. And zines connect people with similar interests and identities and facilitate intimate emotional connections. Usually that's with per zine, so personal zines. It's almost like being allowed to read someone else's diary. And zines have historically brought the queer community and other marginalized groups together. Like, I have a whole other presentation on that, but like, I don't have that content online yet. Uh, so, zines also promote personal growth. This here is uh, my first cut and paste zine. And it was like, it was really important to me to make this. So, zines are great for self expression. And uh, I found personally, and other people have too, that making zines and participating in the community can be really therapeutic. For me personally, it's worked better for me than therapy. <laughs> and the zine ethos tells you that uh, you don't have to have done anything to deserve to be able to talk about yourself and to, for your story to be important. Like that's one of the best things I've learned from the zine community. So zines are great for self-esteem boosts, and they're also great for figuring yourself off and like like through writing and art and expressing that to others. And it's like a great buzzy feeling you get <laughs> from doing that. So let's talk specifically about ace and aero zines. So the first thing that I noticed like in doing all my research is that there's an unusually high number of ace zines like compared to like uh, some other identities. Like it, it's really rare to find a zine focused on pansexuality, even though there's a lot of people who identify as pan. There's a lot of ace zines 
that are either entirely focused on asexuality or just it's a part of a prosing where someone talks about asexuality. And uh, I was going to tell a story here, but huh? <laughs> probably don't have time. <laughs> but basically, that uh, that zine that I showed you earlier, that uh, taking the cake. That was my first zine that I ever ordered online. And finding out that there were other zines that talked about asexuality is what got me into zines. <laughs> and in making my own zines, I've sort of gotten sucked into education work and like awareness work. <laughs> and in 2015, founded, co-founded the Ace Zine Archive. And sadly, I've noticed that there are far fewer aero themed zines out there than are there are ace zines, and the most common themes you see in aero zines are, like, actually, you see a lot of poetry zines, because partly because four of the aero zines that exist out there are put out by the same group, and they're poetry zines. And uh, there's also, uh, there's, I've got a copy of it here, uh, there's uh, Aerospec 101 is, is freely downloadable online. It's sort of hard to find the link to it. And then there's side mentions of uh, aromantic identity in other zines, or zines that focus specifically on aero uh, yeah. And oh, there's also a couple that sort of like the topic, they're sort of smushed together, although it's not specifically aero ace. It's aero and ace. Anything on those two identities are like in the same zine. So. Let's go over how those four reasons I brought up before applied to ACE and Euros. The first section here is going to be the big one with the new research. <laughs> so, ACE and Euros zines is plausible. Zine community and other DIY self publishing has actually been an early proving ground for explorations of ACE terminology and identity specifically. These zines and other texts prove that asexuality has been discussed among queer people and is a part of feminism for decades. More on that later. And ace and aero zines will help future historians uh, document changes in our communities over time. So the zines we make right now are going to be tomorrow's fossils. <laughs> <laughs> and ace and aero zines leave a record of our history in our words, and also uh, they document like how other people are talking about us during that specific time period. So, what was that about asexuality being discussed in zines for decades? Time to rewrite ace history. So, let's go back in time to the 1970s. The first one is not from a zine or a self-published uh, thing, but I, I still think you should see this. This was written in 1973. So, this is talking about, this is a uh, Part of a keynote speech made at the 1973 West Coast Lesbian Feminist Conference by a woman named Robin Morgan. And she's talking about the women's movement, talking about how uh, a lot of different women, not even just lesbians, were like part of the movement and doing great things. So it says they are mostly heterosexuals, but there are asexual and celibate women out there too who are tired of being told that they are sick because this society has said that everyone should fuck a lot. And too many people in the women's movement have echoed, yeah. Fuck with women, or even with men, but for God's sake, fuck, or you're really perverted. <laughs> 1973. And it even separates asexual from celibate. Like, that's the thing that really stuck out to me, yeah. discovering this. That wasn't a fluke. Contemporary self-published literature in newspapers in the LGBT community at the time mentioned asexuality elsewhere, so, though the definitions are still here in the 70s. Here's, uh, an example, it's not really easy to read. Uh, this is a selection from uh, the December 1972 uh, edition of the Lesbian Tide magazine. They're, it's still fairly DIY, even though it's not generally considered a zine. Like that's in the early stages of, like even when zines were called zines. But so it mentions that at this event, there were speakers who were gay, straight, bisexual, and asexual alongside other sexual orientations. Here's another from a different uh, edition of the Lesbian Tide. So uh, it's also mentioning that there are asexual people, uh, or at least it, it may be using a definition, different definition of asexual here, but gay identified asexual people. 
here's a, a I'll, the citations on the next page for this, but I really wanted to show this. Um, this is in an article uh, about bisexuality in another lesbian magazine. I believe this one's called uh, Lavender Woman. And look at this section in red here. I want us to loosen our definitions of lesbianism so that bisexuals and asexuals and newcomers can be accepted into lesbian communities without having to prove themselves worthy of trust in bed or some other way. And yeah, there's also a few other mentions of asexuality on the side from a, a personal perspective. <laughs> so yeah, that last one was from a self-published lesbian magazine called Lavender Woman from 1973. And the rest of the, part, the, rest of the article was about like uh, avoiding bisexual stereotypes. So <laughs> yeah, what, what really did go wrong? <laughs> so now for something that was just uncovered a few days ago. There have been rumors of this for a while, it, that it existed. Someone recently found the full copy. The Asexual Manifesto, look at that. Written in 1972 by uh, Lisa Orlando. So it's, it uses a slightly different definition of asexuality. It's like sort of combined with a sense of feminist morality and ethics. But it's still like getting at something there that's like, it's an early exploration, but it's, it's, it's adjacent to modern day asexuality. I, I wish we had more time to look over this specifically, but uh, if you, if you want to read the whole thing, I can send you a link to where you can download. And, oh, thank, thank you uh, to Rachel Herman and uh, Amy Secretary on Twitter for, uh, for uncovering this in real life in an actual archive. And here's some other uh, like early mentions of asexuality in uh, LGBT cell publications. Uh, Danny Stone helped me out with this. Here's a mention of uh, asexual alongside hetero, homo, and bisexual. And this is from a, a feminist magazine in 1970. Uh, here's uh, another feminist magazine from 1975. Also mentions asexual separate from celibacy. And also separate from Amazon virgins. <laughs> uh, here's another uh, feminist magazine uh, talking about this is like someone, someone's personal, uh, like, like it's part of an interview with various people, one of whom um, identifies as self-sexual and not open to a relationship, and talking about how they don't like being called straight, bisexual, asexual, or non-sexual. Uh, so apparently enough people were using the label back then that people were trying to label them that. So, halfway moving, points. oh, halfway point. Okay, we're actually doing pretty good. So. Moving on from the 70s, let's talk about punk zines in the 80s and 90s. I found some, I, I found some old punk zines from the 80s, from, from, these ones are actually from the 90s. Uh, 1990 for the first one and 1997, where they did polls that included sexual orientation for their readers. And the first one in 1990 was from uh, uh, Maximum Rock and Roll number 81. 1% yeah. asexual responses, and there were over 300 responses, and 2% celibate, again, they separated the two. And then in the one from 1997, it, it literally says sexual orientation, <coughs> asexual, 2%. 620 people responded. And here's some more stuff from different time periods of, from Maximum Rock and Roll that also like mention asexual identity in some way. One of them is from 1983. The other from 2002 in an interview with someone who identified as asexual, a musician. And here are, uh, I also found like other sort of, uh, there was another poll, uh, this one is from a zine called Mutant Renegade 4 from 1994. Uh, I believe it's also, a, it's a specifically queer zine and they included, as for sexual preference, opposite sex, same sex, both or neither. And then one of the more interesting ones like, uh, is actually this small quote here. From, it's from a zine called Homo Core 7 from 1991, which is an important zine in the queer core movement, which is like, they were really big on reclaiming the word queer. And this was sort of from uh, a, a, like a column where it, it was really talking about gender, but 
but this, this sentence came up. So imagine yourself uh, with your sexuality intact as a member of the opposite sex. Would you be gay, straight, bi, asexual, or with a preference, yet celibate? And that is in the queer, queer core, uh, which is like, like queer punk specifically in the late 80s and the early 90s especially. And the fact that asexuality was recognized by those cool people making these zines would be really important for me to find. And that's the cover of the zine. So the, thing that, the things that really got my attention though were 90s Riot Girl zines. So Riot Girl was a uh, Mostly, as, it was a combination of a zine and a music movement um, in the mid-90s especially, but started in the early 90s around, I believe it was 1993 when it started getting big. But, uh, it was mainly about uh, women getting into punk, and they, they popularized some phrases that eventually sort of trickled down into the mainstream. Like, that's where the, the term girl power came from, or right? girls to the front. And it was this, this, it wasn't a perfect space, but it allowed women to talk about things that were taboo at the time or before then, like mental health, uh, like sexuality. Like there were like early uh, porn magazines that were aimed at women. And so here's the story behind me discovering these scenes. This is what got me to research all of this in the first place. That's me at the Barnard Zine Library. Uh, I was doing some online research, and I decided to search the Barnard Zine Library catalog for the word asexual. And I was shocked to find multiple zines from the 90s, which was, at that point, I thought, like, like I, I believed what was the prevailing knowledge, which was that there was no asexual community before, like, about 2001. And maybe in a few comment sections in 1997. <laughs> And eventually I viewed these scenes in person while attending the New York City Feminist Scene Fest. I believe this was 2018, the one. I'm holding one of the zines there and taking notes on it. So what I saw literally made my jaw drop and spurred me on to further research. And all of this research has rewritten my understanding of ace history and probably will eventually do the same for the larger asexual community of this disseminates. This is the zine that got me really excited. This is a compilation zine uh, written by a whole bunch of different people, but edited by Lauren Jade Martin. And I, I found out, I, I reached out to the editor of this scene uh, and got permission to reprint things from it. This zine was put together in 1996. It's called Prude. It's not specifically about asexuality, but multiple people who identified as asexual, uh, was, like, they, they submitted to this scene. I can't reprint all of them because I haven't been able to track down some people, but I, I did find a lot of interesting things, even just specifically from, from Lauren. So th this is on the first, the inside first page, it's information about like why the zine uh, is happening. But I can't really go into too much detail about these because I have too many slides. <laughs> like So here's a, uh, one thing about sexuality being a spectrum, including asexual. Here's a personal account uh, by Lauren about asexuality. Also, 1996, and there's like this much, and it, like, I, it, like I just had my jaw drop like the entire time I was reading through this scene. <laughs> so there were other pieces in Prude and other zines discussed, like there were zines mentioned in Prude that I've also tried to track down. Some of them I have scans of and I have seen the writing that is about asexuality, but I can't print them yet. So that I do have screenshots of the catalog information for some of these, because uh, that's online and freely available. There's, see in the description you can see, it includes writing about asexuality in the Riot Girl movement. These ones, unfortunately, the creator has specifically asked that they not be reproduced can't be interlibrary alone, so you have to actually go there in person to see them. And hopefully I'll get the chance to do that, because I have I didn't get the chance the first time around. Uh, here's one, it's, it's called The Reject. Um, it's written by an author who identifies as asexual, and this was in the mid-90s. 
someone hurts me in Ohio, <laughs> number three. It doesn't actually mention asexual in the description here, but I found a defunct GeoCities website with a review of it that did say that there was <laughs> a mention of, that there was discussion of asexual on there. I, I, when I said I spent hundreds of hours on this, I, I'm very serious. <laughs> and here's another uh, mention of asexuality uh, as like a personal, uh, well, it's not, not as much of an identity as a descriptor in this one. Uh, it's another uh, excerpt from uh, a Riot Girl zine that was publicly, it's publicly available on archive.org. And that one's from 1993. And so, skipping forward a little bit, Warren Jade Martin, who, who put together the Prude zine, wrote about whether asexuality was a queer identity in her zine Quantify Number 4 in 2002. What you're about to see is the thing, is like the thing that made probably the I mean, both made me excited. This one also made really made me excited. Your revolution will not happen between these thighs. <laughs> <laughs> if queer equals not straight, asexuality would fall under that category. But if queer merely means not straight, then that means that heterosexuality is placed at the center. So, they're, they're, so we're going back and forth. But this is a pretty long article. I, I mean, well, it's a part, it's a, it's a subsection of a zine. I, I'm not even showing all the pages here. What does it mean to claim a queer identity that is divorced from sex? And she talks about how she definitely has this queer identity. But at, this, at, at the point in time she wrote this, uh, she, she isn't quite using asexual as like a, a sexual orientation identifier here, but uh, like she also talks about how like to, she doesn't have to be uh, be sexual. Like she, you shouldn't have to be sexual to be queer. Like but that's also like sort of this expectation that's coming, and it's something that's being imposed on people. She was talking about that as well, and so in the bottom, I uh, I, I put a another uh, screenshot here of, from the postscript. There is another scene mentioned here, subject to change number 11, where there's another piece titled Queer Identified Asexual. There were multiple people writing about this simultaneously. I found, a I, I was able to find a, a copy of that scene in the Barmaid Scene Library. I can't reprint from it yet. I haven't heard back yet, but I've seen it, it exists. It was also printed in 2002. And ten sorry for minutes. ten minutes. Yeah. Sorry for the abrupt ending, <laughs> but I, I I was originally going to put more stuff from the early 2000s there, but I I felt I've already had about 70 slides. I probably shouldn't <laughs> put in more. But uh, eventually that will be available online. Uh, I just recently got permission to reprint it, so it's going to come soon. Or at least when I when I put all of this together into an article that I publish. <laughs> so back to the four reasons. Remember the four reasons. <laughs> so, Ace and Arrow zines is a tool for education. Here, here's the Arrow Spec 101 zine. And so once again, these zines have been great as a tool for teaching Ace and Arrow. As long as they, as long as long as they're reprintable or like downloadable in some way, they will spread. And they're also great for discussing intra-community issues, such as the zine series "Facing Silence" um, by uh, my co-founder of the AC Archive. Like, there's actually uh, four issues of them, and lots of people submit to them, and they talk about feeling silenced <coughs> in asexual spaces. So, like, something that's very niche and wouldn't get published anywhere else. And they allow it to go beyond 101 for people within the community. Like, so if you're tired of like seeing like all the articles online or like in like wherever it, the, wherever anyone's talking about asexuality, it's always 101, 101, 101. And uh, so I, I I've got to tell this story. Uh, so this theme here, uh, I edited this in about 2015. Uh, it's about asexuality and relationships. It took me like two years to get enough submissions for it. Then I posted it as a free resource online. Within one week, 
my friend who lives in San Diego uh, said that, that they went to Trans Pride and saw that someone had printed out copies of it and were, was giving them away. I had no connection to whoever was doing this. I didn't. I don't know how they found it. Probably Tumblr. <laughs> Within a week. <laughs> so, getting ACE educational zines into community centers and like other spaces, like they're public or semi-public, like medical waiting rooms, uh, can like it can be it can mean the world to people because like this is it, it meant the world to me. Like, uh, what when I went to college. Um, I, I checked out the LGBT center to see if there was any material about asexuality. There was one card, one 101 card. It still meant a lot to me, though. <laughs> and so we, if we get more uh, acceptance and visibility from educational materials like this, that will make it much easier to bring people into our community. So ACE and ARE teams for community. On the left here, you can see a poster that was made for an event uh, on ACE communities that included a zine workshop. So, ACE and Aero zines, they show up all sorts of places, uh, including zine fests, including queer zine fests. I've got a, I've got a screenshot on a, one of the next slides about that, but this is, uh, uh, I've also, uh, also as mentioned before, zines show up as educational materials of pride. Uh, compilation zines on ACE and Aero topics bring community members together. And ACE and Aero content and non ACE and Aero compilation zines connects people who wouldn't otherwise seek it out. I've actually got an interesting story about that one too. <laughs> so, let's do this quick. <laughs> I submitted something about my uh, my experiences being asexual to this zine, which is about uh, queer women and femmes on heterosexism. Someone uh, found this zine at their uh, a zine library at their university, which is uh, in Boston. This, the zine was printed in the UK. <laughs> they found that zine independent of me, wrote about it in this zine, and I bought this zine at a zine fest at that <laughs> university and opened it up and found myself mentioned in it. <laughs> <laughs> was it good or bad? It was positive. It was like a good, it was like, they were like, like it's great to see someone talking about this thing that I feel. Good. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, Persians bring people together, and people tend to leave contact info at the back of zines. So like, I, I've met interesting people that way, either by emailing them, or by them emailing me. And Ace and Arrow zine trading can and does happen. And as shown here with this poster, queer zine workshops have on many occasions led to inclusion of asexuality and romanticism. So uh, and there's evidence that multiple ACE and queer campus groups have organized specifically ACE and Aero compilation zines for their communities. I've got a few, uh, and, oh yeah, and they normalize our identities and yeah, we're a community. But like, here's, the, here's the screenshots of other events that have happened around the world. This one's from Lithuania. This one's in Oregon. That one's in the UK. And, uh, here's uh, a zine called An Aromantic Manifesto that was featured here uh, as uh, the people who wrote it were featured as a part of the first queer zine fest in Singapore. And that one's a free to download as well. So, last thing, Ace and Aero zines for personal growth. This is uh, a picture of one of my own zines, uh, taken on the train here. <laughs> so, making zines is great for learning about one's asexuality and aromantic and it can help others find the descriptive language to talk about their identities. Lots of people have tell, told me that my zines have helped them do that. People have gone out of their way to contact me about how much their, my per zines meant to them, which feels really good. <laughs> and Ace and Aero zines help you know you're not alone. And making zines defies all those people who would tell us to shut up and that our stories don't matter. And zines help me and others uh, accept and be open about Ace and Aero identities. I've talked about my identity so long. And it can also lead uh, to uh, people into the larger DIY and zine community, which is like really helpful to me and helpful to other people. So this is this is actually I'm not actually gonna teach you how to make a zine. Bad news. <laughs> <laughs>
However, you can download the contents uh, for my zine workshops uh, at this website. You might want to take a picture of that. I, I also have flyers with the information on it uh, if you want to come up with at the end of the workshop or end of the presentation. So, where do you find zines? That's also mentioned in the materials. However, you can also find the ACE zine archive here. And uh, so I post a lot of my research before it gets added to the main website on uh, the Tumblr version. And there's also, uh, there's a, the, the resource I linked a few slides ago, uh, that's also uh, helpful. Yeah, that's finding zines. The Queer Zine Archive Project at archive.org has have a lot of zines that are, have been scanned, including zines from like the 90s and even before that. In fact, that's where I found some of the zines that I showed you earlier. And issue.com is really good. So, you can make a scenario zines. Like, seriously, making zines is awesome. <laughs> Also, any zine with ace and arrow content uh, is eligible for being listed on the ace zine archive. We have a separate page for arrow zines right now, even though it's, it's technically still the ace zine archive, but we felt like it's important to mention these somewhere. Like, there's not really enough for an, an arrow zine archive at this point, but we wanted that to change. So, I'm planning also on putting uh, together a zine of experiences from this conference. If you want to submit something, email me or contact me on Twitter. And if you want to get a link to my completed blog posts and zine on all the stuff that I've been talking about now, but in more detail, uh, sign up for my mailing list. I'll, you can write down your email address in a notebook I have, <laughs> or you can email me. So, last slide. I have a few suggestions here for ideas for making ACE and Arrow zines. Like, I made a list of things that we haven't really seen a lot of yet with the ACE zine archive. So, asexuality in the media, demisexuality and gray asexuality zines. Ace history zines. Zines about the intersection of personal ace identity with other marginalized identities. Mm -hmm. More zines on asexual relationships. Disabled asexual uh, compilation zine would be a great thing to see. Mm -hmm. I was originally planning on doing something like that, but I, I only ended up making that one compilation in the end. Asexual art zines. Mm -hmm. Gender and asexuality zines. Religion and asexuality. There, ha there is one out there that's about Christianity and asexuality specifically. I tried submitting to it but they had already finished printing it by the time I submitted it, even though it was before the deadline. <laughs> I still feel a little annoyed by that. <laughs> and for arrowzine ideas, aloe arrowzines, I, uh, I have only seen one so far. It's called Heartless Bastard Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poetry scene. I have heard tell that there is a 101 a aloe arrowzine in the works, though. A romantic compilation scene. Like, I, like, besides the poetry ones, I haven't seen any that are non-poetry. Arrow-themed fur zines, where that's the entire point of the zine. Uh, arrow history zines. Positive stories of, of group romantic relationships and living as a solo arrow. Arrow 102 plus zines, especially about gray arrow and demi-romantic identities. Uh, zines about the intersection of arrow identities and other identities. And arrow comics. <laughs> that is the last slide. And I managed to just finish it on time as a matter of fact.